Hey guys, Brett Kelly here, R&D engineer at 45 Drives. Um, I'm here today introducing uh, part one of a three-part series of, uh, about clustering and storage clustering with our hardware. And um, this, this part in particular, we discuss really the, the whys. Why cluster? Why is this beneficial to you? Uh, for the main three reasons of its scalability, high availability, performance. Um, uh, we introduced the two clustering software that we specialize and work with well in-house here, uh, Ceph and GlusterFS. Uh, more specifically, we'll be speaking about CephFS uh, and GlusterFS and how they compare and contrast. Um, anyway, so uh, let's get into it. So here we are in uh, 45 Drives, uh, our YouTube studio, and uh, we call it Studio 45, eh, Brett? I like that. Uh, I'm here with Brett Kelly, and Brett Kelly is our uh, lead engineer and head of product development at 45 Drives. And I'm Doug Milburn, and I'm uh, co-founder of the company. Anyway, welcome, Brett. Thanks, Doug. And uh, maybe I'll welcome myself because it's really it's the or you should be welcoming me, right? I guess so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we both work here. How does that work? We both work here, but you spend more time in front of the camera. So. Okay. Well, welcome to my spotlight, Doug. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> okay. Now that we got all that out of the way, um, we came here today. We want to talk about clustering. Uh, clustering is where we take that leap from having single storage servers um, on our network, plug in and need more storage, put on another storage server. They're not joined together. You got to know where to go, which namespace to go in to find your files. Um, great, can take you a certain distance in your storage architecture. But you want to take that next leap, and storage clustering is where we tie them all together with software. You got Layer. it. Yeah. We're going to talk about two software packages. Mm -hmm. Going to limit this to open source. Uh, there are great proprietary options out there which we work with all the time in 45 drives. Mm -hmm. But we want to stay with the two biggies in, uh, in, in open source clustering. So, and those being your favorite, Ceph. Ceph FS. Sorry to steal your thunder there. Yeah, yeah. Good. beautiful. Steal my thunder anytime you want, Brett. Um, and uh, the other one being Gluster mm -hmm. FS. So, Brett. Why would somebody wish to cluster? Why not just use discrete servers and when you need to scale, just add another server in your network? Well, there's three main reasons. Uh, scalability, um, scaled performance, but mainly high availability. As in, they need their service to be up 99.99999% of the time. And that's hard to do with discrete servers because you need manual people intervention and a very large working. So it's easier just to have your clustered source storage system do it for you. Okay, let's go into this. So, uh, scalability. Mm -hmm. So, if I want to grow a cluster in very general terms, what do I have to do to, to scale it out? You add another storage server. Or if your storage servers that you have are only half filled, you add some more hard drives. Okay. And any software? And of course, software? there's a little bit of software administration. Of course, it's not, you just plug it in, it's not that magic. Okay. Well, then I wouldn't have a job, right? So. <laughs> but it's pretty minimal, right? It's very minimal. It's yeah, very minimal. Very, very yeah. minimal. Okay, uh, let's talk about scaling performance. Okay. What do you mean by scaling performance? Okay, so in, that's a, f a good question because a lot of people think of performance like, oh, more servers, my throughput goes up. It's not so much throughput, a single client transfer, if you'd imagine. If you were sitting at your desk and you pull a file down, you're not going to get a big difference from just a single server or you have a cluster server. What you're going to see is as your business uh, grows or if your business is exporting to the end user, the more users you have, the more parallel performance gains you'll see. So when I talk about scaling performance in a cluster, as your business grows, your performance grows with you. As your user base grows, your performance grows with your cluster. Okay. So, so the load distributes over multiple machines? Exactly. That's exactly it. So a great reason for using a cluster. Just explain to me, and again, in very general terms, availability. What, what's that mean in a cluster? Why is a cluster more available than a single server? Okay, we'll keep it simple. You have two servers. They're both exporting as a single namespace, and one of them fails. Typically, if you're running a single server, have, like heads pop up in the desks, and everyone's go, oh, I can't, I can't do anything. Well, with a highly available setup, you can imagine these two servers. One goes down, the second one picks up from where it left off. So, like I said, if you lost a server, your performance, when it, in a case like that, might fall down a little bit. But you do not lose access. Okay, and you mentioned the two server uh, example, but as it scales out to more, it's, it's only going to get better. I did that for simplicity's sake. Yeah, this yeah. scales bigger and bigger. And typically with clusters, the bigger you make them, the better they get. Okay. So, okay, Brett. So somebody decides they want a cluster. 
uh, and we're talking we're limiting uh, this you know good storage clustering in, in, in many environments proprietary environments but we very specifically want to talk about open source clustering and we're going to limit it to Ceph FS mm -hmm. and we're going to limit it to Gluster FS. Okay. Why those two platforms? Why are they should they be of in particular interest? Well, mainly because of their adoption in the field, both by users and by developers, as in both have pro like professional backing by Red Hat and um, uh, for example, Facebook uh, uses a lot of Gluster um, in their infrastructure. Uh, CERN, some of the most advanced physics experiments that we are running as humanity, store a lot of their data on a Ceph cluster. Um, it's just a well adopted on both user and developer side. Okay. Plenty of documentation around it. It's, it's hard to say no, really. So, so these uh, open source projects have uh, critical mass. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Okay. So it's like with a lot of open source, some people go, I don't know, what if the developer just decides to stop working on it. That's not the case. There's a lot of businesses who invested a lot of money into these two technologies. They're not going away. They're only going to get better. Right on. Um, and I guess the other thing we can add is proven performance, that the two of these are, uh, you know, they have all the performance parameters. These are mature platforms ready for use now. There's no waiting for anything to come around, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, as in with open source, there's always a little bit that, oh, it, it does this, but not quite yet. Um, yes, they are uh, fully production ready. Like I mentioned, a couple big, big, big players in the world use them. Um, of course, there's always a bit of fringe features that we're still waiting to get added in, but you'll see that in every software package. But to answer your question directly, yeah, the performance is there. If you know how to use it, of course, these are kind of complex IT systems, right? So there's sizing the right application for what your workload is. But yeah, production stability, performance-wise, they, they get the job done. Okay. So if I make the leap to clustering, I, I guess a sensible threshold would be when you get a beyond the size of what you can keep on a single server, if you're gonna go beyond there, you see yourself growing that it's time to consider clustering. You got it. Okay. I'd say if, if you see yourself growing, if your data needs are greater than what you can fit in one of our XL60s, one of the densest servers you'll find, um, or if you need that always up, highly available, like I mentioned, that's when you should really start thinking about clustering. You know what, so one thing comes up if you're an IT professional and you're running IT infrastructure in an organization that uh, is running off single servers right now. Should, if I'm that person, should I be intimidated by the thought of clustering? No, not anymore. Uh, 10 years ago or so, um, yeah, it was complex, Linux, you were always kind of playing that game of is it supported by the big guys, but where the way is software defined storage and open source Linux base of technology, it's a lot open or of a market, sorry to put it in that horrible way, but... Uh, Opener, that's a, ver that's a uh, I'm, word, I'm, is it? I yeah. engineer, not English. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a lot less scary, there's a lot more interplay from uh, open source tools with proprietary window, like Windows Active Directory and stuff. Merging those in is painless now. Um, but to answer your question, ClusterFS is a very easy learning curve, as in it's a very traditional way. It's just bridging a file system across a bunch of servers. So if you're familiar with traditional storage servers and file systems, you, you won't be that afraid of it. The, the concepts, oh, that makes sense, I just do this now. Ceph is a bit scarier at first look because it's a whole new beast. It's, it's objects underneath instead of files. But once you kind of stop, think about it, and understand the concepts, you'll go, oh, wow, this is actually kind of simpler. So that's why they kind of deem storage, Ceph, as the future of storage. As in, once we grow to these huge, huge, huge limits where we kind of run the end of file system, we'll talk about it a bit later, but why file systems start to slow down when they get too big. Object storage is just the best for that, so. Once you kind of get over that little bit of a steep learning, learning a steeper learning curve with Ceph, it's uh, it's not that scary of a technology either. You know, it's interesting. That just evokes memories for me. I uh, developed a lot of software in the past, and I, I bridged the world of structured programming in the early days of object-oriented programming. It's, it's the same thing in software development uh, yeah. coming along, and uh, you know, objects were. Uh, you know, a little intimidating when it was uh, brand new concepts, but then after a while, you go, how did anybody yeah, ever yeah, not like this see this? this how you ever live without it? Yeah, you got it. And I see that happening as well. Of course, there will always be a need for file systems. That's why CFFS exists, because it's a file system on top of the object. 
Um, it, you'll never go away. You need file system, but uh, it's definitely a great way to deal with a lot of data. Okay. So for the availability, so your, your, your comments on availability, the more servers, the better. So it's almost like in a smaller volume cluster, you might be better off using small, more smaller machines if availability and, uh, and, and performance scale out is. That's a great, it's a great, great question. It's, it's something I answer with my sales team and, and the customers a lot. Um, do I go least amount of servers as possible, as dense as possible, or, or like the scenario you said? And I'm going to give you the answer that they always hate hearing from me, case by case basis sometimes. Um, but yeah, you're right. For more performance, like if performance is, is paramount, you care about nothing else, then yeah, scale out, get more parallel, and only half fill your server and fill the rest of it as you need it. If you have cold, old archival cold data that you need to keep, but you don't care about performance or get as long as it's there, it's safe and you're good. Go dense, get three servers, and the high availability, like, and then high availability. Same idea. If if it's you, you kind of have to rank what you need: performance, scalability, high availability. Like how, what's the most important to me? That'll help size your nodes counts. So, hopefully that was a conciser answer than what I sometimes give them. But And your group, um, you guys do this on a regular basis. We help customers architect, yep. uh, right from the architecture point yep. of view, and what do you want? You know, is it performance, or is it availability, is it density, is it rack density, or whatever else. you got all those choices you can yep. do. You got it. Uh, and making the comment, I, I guess one other comment is that we should touch on in just general architecture of clusters. When we talk about performance and you talk about high and low performance, when you're talking about stor storinators, you know, especially the mid and high powered storinators, um, you know, with large, today's large drives and large RAID arrays reading out in parallel, we're talking very, very high speed anyway. It's really your connectivity tends to be the limit for yep. most, of our, most of our customers. Yeah, you got it there. Um, it, network will always, always, sorry, almost always be your bottleneck in that case. Um, but like with like whenever you talk about performance, everyone always focuses on the throughput number. And the throughput number, while very important, also needs to be quickly addressed with a latency or I/O per second. As in, if you have a pipe that can give you data in three gigabytes a second, but it takes three minutes for it to find the file and start giving back to you, that's not going to feel like three gigabytes a second. So it is that balance point of getting the, the, the latency, the I.O. performance of everything, as well as your pipe in and out of each Which service. Which hugely has to do with your cluster, clustering software. software exactly. Layer. And then, and yeah. that's where the nuts and bolts and mechanics of how the clustering software does its job comes into play. All right, so that was part one of three. I hope you enjoyed. Um, where we kind of talked about the whys and why clustering, and especially clustering with our hardware, can really be beneficial to your uh, storage requirements. So uh, why don't you continue on and join us in part two of the video where we really dive into the nitty-gritty of the difference between CephFS and GlusterFS and how to choose which one's right for your environment.